Welcome back, Alejandro. I'm so excited to learn about NVIDIA with you. And I hope our audience appreciates these kinds of videos. If you appreciate them, please give this video a like and also share your feedback. We'd love to also hear from you out there if you have any questions about some of these stocks or other insights you'd like to add because the semiconductor industry is pretty complex for some people. Like I have not been involved in this area. So it's very interesting to learn about what this company is all about. And, you know, I've heard in the news that NVIDIA is very strong in the AI space and a lot of people, that's uh, a big topic to talk about these days. So with that, Alejandro, welcome back and please take it away. Hello, Michelle. Hello, everybody. As you said, yeah, NVIDIA is a very interesting company. A lot of things to learn about. It's one of the companies I didn't know much before starting to study, but uh, I mean, you, you, you get to learn very cool stuff. So let us start, for example, with the name. Why NVIDIA? The reason NVIDIA is because they wanted to be the envy of the rest of the people, of the rest of the companies. So when they started, there was around 86 companies, basically with the same researchers, same capital, same, I mean, let's say I say amount of people. And out of those 86 today, there's only a NVIDIA. And, no, I think there's only NVIDIA. So that's the only company survive. How this happened? Uh, several several things, but as we're gonna see later on, we're gonna understand better. So what they do, they design graphic processing units, application programming interfaces, and system on a chip. They have several reporting segments, which data centers, gaming, professional visualization, automotive, OEM, and other. So as I said before, these are three systems that or you could, I mean, if you see it for the first time and you don't know much about it, they could be considered as a commodity, but the more you get to study, and obviously this is one of the big reasons NVIDIA dominates so much is because their system, their graphics are better there. Some of the units are way faster. So as like, let's say it was like in a sugar, I mean, Coke buys sugar from different providers probably, but I don't think that the sugar can um, be that different. In the other side, the product that NVIDIA has been able to develop, they are very, very different. So being, you could think it's a commodity, but it's really not big and they dominate a big, big part of the market. So what markets they serve? And here we see how, how big their, their markets are like mobile, computing, automotive, architecture, engineering, construction, media and entertainment, and scientific research. So all this is basically what, what it's all about in the world these days. I mean, they are changing the world. They are definitely changing the world. And uh, the more I read about, the more I understand how strong they are. But again, as we always say, and repetition is, is key to, to learning. And Buff always says, just because they're a very strong company doesn't mean it's a good investment if if they are value very high. And um, not sure if people know, but they are value almost at 80 PE, which is, I mean, to me is, I don't know, even we're going to see later the growth and all, but it's very expensive because when you value something that high, a lot of things have to work out and they might, they might probably go to three trillion like Apple, who knows? But again, I feel to predict this type of stuff is, is very, very difficult. And a lot of ha things have to work out. Like for example, a lot of robotics, they are betting also like on self-driving cars. A lot of that stuff needs to happen for them to really basically justify their value. So interesting topics, putting everything on the line. I learned a lot about like business-wise um, with them. I mean, I, I think it's a very interesting company to learn a lot of things about business because they, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, they were 86 at the beginning and now there's only one. But for this to happen, it's not like, oh yeah, uh, Jensen Wang, who's a founder and the founders were, was just so smart and so far ahead of everybody. They just were able to, to execute, but even him, he says, they've been very lucky. And again, this, this is what happens with, 
with many people and um, we think, oh, I mean, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that don't like to accept that there's a lot of luck involved. Obviously there is like world ethic, good ideas, um, good products, all that, that, that is very important. But I mean, a lot of things has to work because 86 people, yeah, maybe he was one of the smartest one, but there was 86 other people trying to do the same thing, trying to compete the other market away. And he was the one who won. Who knows why? I mean, yeah, obviously he was very per perseverant, but he, he got luck too. So the future of the world, serving cars, robotics, as I said before, this has to work for them to really justify the price. It's probably going to come, but we don't know how fast. They, they are pretty advanced in many of their, their products. So it's not that easy to, as I said before, to just like take market from them. But again, other parts need to work because, yeah, I mean, they can be like the number one provider. They can have, I don't know, let's say 90% of the self-driving cars, like in their specific parts. But again, there needs to be a market for self-driving cars. And I mean, probably there is, but I, I'm not very familiar with but the price of those things can be pretty expensive. So all these things are going to come into to play. The culture of the company different from Apple that is like really divided. And, and this comes from, I, I have a very good friend, which was one of the first employees of, of NVIDIA. And he, he was an engineer. I mean, he, he, he retired pretty young because of how, thanks to the stock. And this is pretty cool. And he is funny because even the first time I met him, he said that, uh, I mean, he just got lucky because there was 89 other Bruce's because his name is Bruce and in other companies, but they didn't get as lucky to, to be in the right place at the right time. So now he's like a little more than 50 and he's retired. Uh, as I said, he told me that like, and, and Jensen Wang, he also talks about this, but this guy is telling me from like first um, data, like first principle, <laughs> like first person basically, that they are very collaborative. I mean, they don't have like secrets and everybody can really come to the to the party. So like if they hire somebody like from university, I mean, he, he is listening. So they really believe in everybody can have a great idea, which I guess uh, is a little different from Apple, for example. But again, I mean, it has worked for both. A CEO conclusion about business. This is super interesting because he was on a podcast a few months ago and they asked him, if he has to start a company, uh, what would it be? And he's like, he answered, I will not start a company. And, and this is pretty surprising for a guy that is probably worth $20 billion. But the reason is, and, and he really emphasizes, I, I saw a lot of interviews about him. He's, he's a very interesting character, pretty funny, but again, uh, full of knowledge and he, he's done it. So, I mean, you, you get to learn and you believe, obviously, from somebody that is been so successful that it's so hard to start businesses that just many times it's just um, easier to just buy into businesses. Actually talking about this, I was listening to one of Buffett um, shareholder meetings this morning walking and he was, uh, I think it was 2008. Yeah, it was 2008 when, when they, they talk a little about building a business and Charlie asked him, I mean, the only real business we we have um, built was the, the one that G. Jane manages, the insurance, the proper, property casualty, I think. Yeah. No, 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 no. The PC, the, um, what is it? Okay. I'm, I, I, I'm uh, some of the um, catastrophic risks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that is the, what it is. And that, I mean, and he, and he said, this is basically the only business they have built. So, I mean, they've been very successful, but uh, something I, I love about him, he's like always, I mean, he just wants to be in good businesses, relate to good, good people. Something interesting he said, like, for example, I think one time they asked him what makes a good leader. And, and this is talking about Buffett. And he said, a good leader is made by leading good people. I mean, you can be the best leader in the world, but if you're leading just like, a bunch of people that do not want to do their job, I mean, you're not going to be a good leader. So it's the same concept that just 
getting a good business. And again, going back to Jensen, one, he he really, um, I mean, he really emphasizes how hard it is. So, I mean, how, how much pain you have to to go through to really make this this great company. And a lot of people, I mean, Job said it. I mean, it's like, it, he, he said one time, I think it's like eating glass but just keep going. So you really have to love it. You really have to think in the vision. So for people out there that maybe want to start a business, I mean, yes, it's, it's great, but don't do it for the money. There has to be a big reason because even if it's something small, you have to really love what you do and, and, and understand. I mean, more than the money is, is the passion. And lastly, building supply before demand. Uh, it's funny because we talked the other day about Facebook and that's kind of what Zuckerberg is doing, kind of like building a lot of supply, building a lot of, and that demand wasn't there. And this is uh, a playbook from uh, Jensen. He, he, he did that. So, I mean, many times they just build, build markets that um, they weren't there and now they're, they're here and he, he had the, the vision. He calls it perspective. He doesn't like to use the word vision. And one last uh, interesting topic was that he he started by uh, Don Valentine, the guy from Sequoia Capital. He was one of the first investors, and and a funny story is like at the end of the meeting, he 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 told him, "If you lose, uh, like uh, Don Valentine asked, told him, if you lose my money, I kill you." <laughs> I mean, just being funny. I mean, I think he wow. I don't <laughs> haven't studied much about him, but they say well, he's pretty funny. And um, it's interesting because the Sequoia, a lot of the culture there, um, weren't they also a similar type of um, founding people like Buffett? Like when um, when Buffett closed down his partnership, didn't he recommend some people to go over to, I want to say Bill Ruane and people at Sequoia because they have sometimes similar principles like Buffett. So it's kind of interesting how there's a little bit of a connection there. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're totally right. He, he recommended uh, was Bill Rain maybe? Yeah, Bill Rain or there was another. I, I remember mm -hmm. he said there was two, but I don't remember yeah. if it was Bill Rain or, or the other one. Yeah, there's two, I think, yep. So the customers, I mean, what better than this can it get? But at the same time, obviously, I mean, this is some of the customers, but I mean, all the big guys are are with them, but obviously, you you have to to negotiate with these guys is not easy. So I mean, they do have a, a pretty pretty big power. I mean, if they are able to to squeeze the, the profits that they are getting from these guys is because they are really like far ahead. But now, as we see at the last line, Apple stopped using Nvidia GPU no long ago. The reason is because they want to start building in house. And again, it's a good move by Apple. Who knows? Probably. <laughs> they always do good things, but again, maybe they are scared of Nvidia getting too much power. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, this happened like two months ago. So the balance sheet, my my favorite part always. <laughs> so as we see, account receivable inventories is eight billion if you add them up, and then you. You subtract you, their their accounts uh, payable, and it's basically five billion. And this this company is worth more than one trillion. So I mean, it's just it's just crazy how these little numbers come up to. I mean, if you see this balance sheet and you didn't know the company, there's no way, no way in the world you could guess that this company is worth so much. And uh, we're gonna see later on. So the income statement from 2021 to 2023 which was January, they didn't really, I mean, they, they grew from 21 to 22, but uh, the big thing we're gonna see later on in a, a thank you. So here's that, that thank you. And I think what this is one of the reasons, and, and again, this is, uh, as you see, I mean, they basically doubled their, their revenue in a year. And this is again, crazy, but again, as, as I always quote Buffett, but I mean, this is not, probably that style of company that he will like just because I mean he he he's more like into the security I feel he always invests in company and and again I, I agree with him there's no reason to 
jump in these very high expectation companies when there is companies that in the stock market you get so so such a good offer like for example like we talk again about meta a uh, the other day i mean meta came down so much and it was easy to see that they were a winner but again I, as i told the story i i missed it because of the influence of lilu but everything is a lesson yeah well and it's interesting also to look at like while nvidia is posting these impressive numbers and there's a lot of hype with ai is it sustainable for them to be able to keep up this performance or you know because sometimes um i've heard the semiconductor industry is a little cyclical so sometimes there there's different you know kind of swings in the market of you know like a lot of semiconductors will be bid up and even monish Prabhai used to own a lot of micron technology which is another semiconductor company and then he sold a lot of it so like there's a lot of ups and downs sometimes in this semiconductor space so like sometimes we don't always know is it doing so well financially because it's sustainable or is this kind of like a, a temporary you know boost where there's so much hype and it's in the news and maybe maybe they got all this revenue because they sold long-term contracts but maybe they're not getting that same revenue every year you know so like there could be some um some swings that we're not fully aware of at first glance so there's there's a lot like while it's impressive what we're saying is to dig deeper on what these numbers mean and what they represent and like to me it's key if if it's sustainable or not like that's what i think is um a, a big point to to kind of think about is like, can they continue performing the way that the market seems to be expecting? Because like you said, they gave them a pretty high valuation. Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, I mean, I just, I, I honestly think there is a lot of speculation with this company because nobody really knows. I mean, I, I don't think as, as we said before, I mean, that, I mean, they are connected to robotics and self-driving cars, which is probably a huge market. I, I'm not aware right now what, what's the value of that market but it's probably huge and if everything works out well and i said before i mean their parts are pretty they're better than the competition that's why they have do, they dominate so many markets where they they are present but again this there's a lot of things that has to play out I always think like everybody's like oh yeah i uh self-driving cars are gonna but i mean it's not that easy i mean for example for a person that has a car from one year to seven years, what is he going to do with a car? Just throw it away and just buy a self-driving car? Maybe a person that is like, I mean, uh, that has a lot of money can do that, but I mean, it's not even good for the world, like for the climate. Just, I mean, w what would you do with that car? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't see it that clear. I, ju I just think it is, I mean, it's a great company, has great things. They're changing the world. I really, I, appreciate the CEO. I mean, he's, he's super cool, but I, I feel it's very hard to predict. And, and I tend to send, say, say this often, but again, I, I just think it's better to, and, and we as investors need to, as Monish Parai always says, I mean, you have to get hit like with a 10 foot pole in your head and, and then you, you see that investment, but sometimes it's very to just, just, be more negative and put a lot of stuff in the too hard pile because when you really find something you you can really put a good amount of your capital on it and 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 really make some good money without risk yeah and one more thing to your point about that is like why did berkshire hathaway invest in taiwan semiconductor compared to nvidia you know they could have easily put four billion dollars into any semiconductor company like, why did they choose TSM over NVIDIA, for example, or any other, you know, strong semiconductor company? So it, it makes you, you know, like you said, ask a lot of these questions. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, hundred. I mean, obviously, I, I don't know, but probably, I mean, the, the price with NVIDIA has been so, I mean, it's, it's, it's going very high up last year, but it's been, it's been pretty high. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware, but their P is probably never been below 50. So uh, this is the, the little debt that I would like to see. And 
one of the reasons I bring it back is because we, I mean, many times uh, people tell, tell, I mean, we put in our mind, oh, we don't need to invest in companies that have, have debt. But again, to recap, re-say what I, I said before in other places is debt is good or bad. It really depends on your, your structure, your rate. You cannot put the same a qualification to a company that, that has $10 billion in debt and is paying 8% and their 8% is due within five years to a company like this one that has $10 billion in debt, but they're, they have payments that are due between 200, 2040 and 2060. I mean, they have like almost $4 billion due then. So again, it's very important to analyze the debt of every company because I, I feel um, schools always teach that debt is bad, but it really depends in every single case. So that's why looking at every company is very important, not just go with this. We always want a, an equation. Oh, if debt is uh, above 10%, oh, bad. No, I mean, it, again, it depends. Uh, I wanted to show here that Mellanox purchase, which was one of the Vida's last purchases. Um, this is, I mean, they just use it to to integrate with their system, which is is great. But I I point out that goodwill and the intangible assets. So basically, out of a seven billion dollar purchase, six point three are goodwill and intangible asset. Again, these are expectations, and and uh, they probably, I mean, they're probably very good, and it probably going to pay out in the in the long term. But is is something that Buffett and Munger always said. I mean, most of corporate buys are uh, bad because, and I think human behavior plays a lot into this, and is the the seller wants to show that he's doing something. Yeah, yeah, I'm opposite. The, the buyer wants to show, like many times if this is CEO that is not the owner, wants to show that he's doing something. In this case, that's not the case because Jensen One is, is the, I mean, the founder and CEO. But I'm, and the seller obviously wants to sell the piece for the more he can get. So a lot of times this doesn't play out. I mean, I, I haven't really found where there's like history of a lot of these things. I mean, I just found it in each annual report, but it'd be pretty interesting because in the long run, most of them don't play out. And I'm, I'm quoting Buffett and Munger, so I guess yeah. that's right. <laughs> well, and what this seems to suggest is there's a lot of this company's value that they purchase that's kind of tied up in not tangible assets. So not like, you know, physical things, but maybe intellectual property of this company. So like by buying this company, they, they're they trying to leverage that intellectual property and maybe it's for research and development, like using that brain power to maybe bring some NVIDIA uh, things to the next level if, you know, if the research that went into whatever this company produced, if that's extremely valuable, but now it's it's sitting on the books like this, right? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree, I agree with you. And I mean, obviously they, they do it too many times to just like, I don't know, in, in other industries, if you're a restaurant, you just buy the, the chain in town or, or stuff like that, just to put it in, in perspective where it's easier to understand. But again, I mean, it's so much what they pay for goodwill and intangibles that compared to, to the true price, because for the for the founder of this, I mean, it has cost him 600 million and they are he's getting almost 11 times his money. <laughs> so that's pretty, pretty crazy. So the moat, as I, I said several times, is the best technology in the field that you will think will be a commodity. Data center procurement standard researcher has a very high switching cost and their customers trust them to keep coming with the latest technology and the better. I mean, they they turn around their products so so much faster than the competition that, and I did done this for so many years that they are a very trustworthy company in, in, the, in the industry. But again, as with everything, um, it's an analysis that each person has to do that we, obviously try to share as much knowledge as we get from studying. And this this was a great exercise for me because I didn't know much about NVIDIA. 
and now I know more. But my conclusion is definitely is, is, is very, very hard to predict this company. Definitely very hard and at that price. But yeah, my opinion. That's not an advice, obviously. Not right. investment advice. Right. Yep. Yeah, of course, we're just trying to study here. So this is, of course, only for educational purposes. And one of the things that I think could help if anybody out there wants to learn more about semiconductor companies is maybe to compare them. Like, I still have an open question to myself. Like, I've never seen a good chart. Maybe someone out there has where they compared the different ones. Like, what what is the specialty of NVIDIA compared to you know, what does Micron do and Taiwan Semiconductor and ASML, which is a Dutch company that's very specialized as well. Like there's a lot of, you know, people in this space and it makes you wonder, you know, do they compete directly or maybe NVIDIA is competing directly with Apple since you mentioned earlier that Apple stopped using NVIDIA. So could Apple be coming out with a competing product, like say their M1 chips that they use in their laptops, maybe, you know, in in kind of consolidating intellectual property around Apple's uh, way, could they be competitive or are they going to just stay niche to serve only the MacBooks? So those are some of the questions that I have is like, if, if you want to dig deeper into this company and other related companies is to kind of compare the, the similarities and differences between these kinds of companies. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, I mean, just, just reading about it, reading the annuals, reading the thank yous of the competition is, I mean, there's nothing better to learn. Obviously, listening to conference calls is good, but I mean, the more, the more, the more you, you study, the more you learn, the, the more knowledge and data you build in the warehouse of, of our head, which is what it's all about to, to get better at investing, I feel. Yeah. And and for sure, I agree with all of that. And another hint that we can get is we saw Berkshire Hathaway and Monish Babrai sell out of a lot of their semiconductor stocks. So it makes you wonder why, why did they do that? Like, it's not to say they're right because super investors aren't always right about everything, but they they tend to be really good at doing their homework. So it, it gives you another case to investigate. Like. What could be the case for investing in companies like this or against investing in companies like this based on what some of the super investor trends might also be? So that's just something, you know, keep in the back of your mind as another learning opportunity. So uh, I want to say thank you so much, Alejandro, for sharing uh, this knowledge with us today. I greatly appreciate it and hope the audience also got a lot out of this. Thanks to you, Michelle. It was a pleasure. Yeah, take care. Bye.